This is the OTB Television Network, a service of Capital District Off-Track Betting. They come to the eighth ball and California Chrome is absolutely sensational. California Chrome shines bright in the Kentucky Derby. We'll take charges surging and it's a photo finish. It's too close to call. African Story wins the Dubai World Cup. Mojo, Mojo Man. Broadcasting live from the Capital OTB Studios, this is Racing Across America with Seth Merrow. Good morning and welcome back to Racing Across America. We are live from the studio in Albany after being uh, live from the backstretch throughout the Saratoga race meet. That was fun, but uh, we're back in the studio now and this will be fun as well as it's always great to get back in the studio and connect with some of the people we haven't been in touch with over the past, uh, what, seven weeks or so. That will happen on this show as we'll be talking to Jenny Reese a little later on from the Louisville Courier Journal and talk a little bit about uh, the Churchill Meet, which kicks off tonight with a Downs After Dark program. But we're going to kick things right off with one of our favorite guests, and we haven't talked to him throughout the Saratoga Meet. But uh, we're joined now by Ellis Starr, National Racing Analyst from Equibase. Good morning, Ellis. Good morning, Seth. Good morning, racing fans. Glad to be back on. Uh, hope you had a great time uh, at the spa. Yeah, how could you not have a great time? It was a, a great race meet, uh, dominated by very good weather and some very good racing. And Ellis, before we get into some thoughts on the stakes action this weekend, which is why we're talking to you, I want to go back to the Saratoga meet, and uh, we're going to watch the stretch run of the Travers. We are going to watch number uh, for VE Day, get it done over number seven, Wicked Strong. The Jim Zacta, Jimmy Jerkins gets it done. But it was also a win at 19-1 uh, to 1 for Ellis Starr. Uh, the uh, Travers that weekend was the feature race on Equibase, and you're right up. You put VE Day on top. Talk a little bit about the selection. Well, I appreciate that. You know, it, it, every once in a while, for those with handicap and use figures, and I use it as a basis, it's not the end all. I say that many times don't care what kind of figures you use, and there are many good figure-making companies out there. But I do use the Echo Race figure. I do look at others as well. But occasionally when the figures are way off between one and another, you can get a price because the public gravitates towards certain figures over others. And in this particular case, for whatever reason, even though the uh, Jim Dandy and uh, the Curlin were run one day apart at Saratoga prior to the Travers, the Jim Dandy was rated much higher by some of the Echo Base, other Echo Base competitors but the Echo Bay speed figure for the Curlin was actually came out as a faster race. There was some difference between the track one day and the next, and that's the basis. One of the basis for the speed figure is the variant, uh, the daily variant. And for some reason, it came out faster. And I just looked at it and said to myself, "Well, I know the horse is on a streak. I know he likes Saratoga as a race over the track, and the set, etc., cetera, etc." Cetera. If that figure holds up, and they're all moving forward because they're good three-year-olds, so they should move forward. If you can assume they all are then he could certainly be a contender here, and that was my premise for it, was he had a 111 Echo Bay speed figure coming in. The, uh, the That was up from the Curlin. The Jim Danny figure was uh, 105, I remember, and it was faster, and he ran that race again. Now, he was the only one of those horses coming out of the race that was running at the end, but still, uh, you know, that's how you make money. You make money by being right when the public's wrong, and people that read that story and bet a few bucks on the horse did well and i'm really glad about that yeah i have to admit i did not give a lot of uh contention to the uh runners coming out of the curl and and charge now who also came out of the curl or curl and ran second behind ve day didn't show much in the travers but that said a little bit later uh last weekend uh Pertonico came back and won the uh smarty jones so seemed to validate maybe those numbers that came out of the the uh curl and yeah, it, it, you never know. Like I say, it doesn't always work out that way. When you, usually they're pretty close in terms of, you know, good races, but occasionally from one day to the next, because they are, there is some subjectivity in the, even the automated, non automated speed figure makers, you know, that do the work uh, figuring out the track from one day to the next, and occasionally it makes a difference. It doesn't always happen, but I, I will say, I mean, I, I feel lucky and blessed, as you know. You know, that was good. The Derby worked out well earlier in the year, top fortitude. I've had some good luck in the big races, and hopefully it'll continue as we move to Breeders' Cup. That's what I'm really hoping for. Well, we're hoping it continues today as we talk about some more races. But before we get, to, uh, before we get to those, let me just ask you overall, again, we haven't been able to talk to you 
since we've been up uh, at Saratoga for the past uh, six, seven weeks. Um, just wanted to get, get some thoughts on the summer racing. I thought there was some really intriguing, uh, obviously the Travers, uh, Palace Malice having a little bit of a dud in the uh, Whitney, uh, Marino, and it's my lucky day facing off and running very well in both the Whitney and the Woodward. So the uh, older division has been kind of interesting, but I think maybe the most intriguing thing that's happened since uh, we've talked to you last, I think shared belief in the uh, Pacific Classic. What were some of the standouts uh, over the summer to you? Well, sure, I believe it's a good example. You know, he just came through. He had to improve a lot, and he did, uh, beating older and just running so well. So certainly as you move into the fall, we're going to have a lot of interesting storylines about the handicap division of horses on BE Day, of course. Another one that will probably be facing older when we get around to the time about the Gold Cup. Um, nothing really. It, it, honestly, it's kind of a blur for me other than those, you know, big races. I, I saw some really good two-year-olds, uh, as a matter of fact, all the horses that begin with the word conquest on the West Coast, <laughs> really, really good horses from the Cassie Barn. Looking forward to them expanding. And, of course, uh, a lot of good trail racing this weekend, uh, particularly on the grass with Kentucky Downs open to Texas. So I'm just paying attention to those guys and watching as they blossom and mature. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, let's get into some of the weekend action. You're going to take a look at three kind of disparate uh, uh, races across the country. We're going to kick things off with the Super Derby down at uh, Louisiana Downs. Uh, that will be race number eight uh, on their track Saturday. Grade two event, $400,000, mile and an eighth. Kind of an interesting field in here. Uh, I think the, the action will go towards Vickers in trouble. It is Mike Maker, Ken and Sarah Ramsey. This is the horse that won the Louisiana Derby earlier this year. Has not validated that since. Was well beaten in the Kentucky Derby. Third in the Iowa Derby, third in the West Virginia Derby. I still think this horse is going to take some action. Louis Flower, who I thought was interesting coming out of the two-year-old season, has absolutely not validated that, but ran a decent third here in a prep for this race last time. So Louis Flowers may be a little bit interesting. I think Jessica Starr is a little bit interesting as well. But the Super Derby is this week's feature race on Equibase. Your write-up is available now if folks want to go over. And you put a horse on top that I find uh, intriguing. I want to hear your thoughts on this. And we're going to go back to August 3rd down at Gulfstream Park and look at an allowance victory by victory nor defeat. That will be the number 10 horse getting up and getting it done as the 3-2 to two favorite that day. This one's very lightly raced, coming out of this win down at Gulfstream, but stepping it up a little bit maybe in this company on Saturday. But it's the horse you have on top. Your thoughts? Well, I'm a big believer in patterns with young horses, two and three-year-olds, is one of the reasons that E Day was a top pick. And first of all, there's a pace battle here, because I'd be cool as a horse that's had the lead of the first call in his last eight, uh, but he can't. He, he's going to be dogged. Vickers in trouble. I think he'll be first or second, if not first early, and then a horse towards the outside. Gold appointment, I think, is an early pressure type. Victory Nord Feet comes from far, far back, kind of a VE day running style. But uh, as a lightly race horse, I love the pattern here. Off the layoff in, on March 30th, on July 5th, he ran third sprinting in the stakes at Gulfstream, and then he stretched out to a mile, still one turn. But he won nicely here and got a back-to-back -back 103 Echo Bay speed figure. It's kind of a paired figure pattern that he could improve on. But he really gets the pace. By on Bottle Song, Avenue, from the mayor. I think he's got no problem getting nine furlongs here. I think, think the public just doesn't see him coming. They're going to think he's too far back. I'm hoping for a pace tool. If I don't get it, it doesn't work, and he doesn't win. The one, Jessica Starr, has certainly done nothing wrong in his career with four wins, three seconds, and seven races. Just lost East Hall in the Ohio Derby, and East Hall will be my third pick because this horse, as we all know, had such promise, and Bill Kaplan loved him earlier this year. Uh, you know, he ran third behind General A-Rod and Wildcat Red in the Gulfstream Derby. Two races later, fourth in the Fountain of Youth. But then he kind of went off form, came back, and got a couple seconds into minor stakes, and then that, that headwind in the Ohio Derby. You know, Ohio Derby's not as prestigious as it used to be, but... It's still a really good race for the horse. He's another one coming. So if the pace duel comes up like I hope it will with the three or four horses battling, then it's going to come. My horses, hopefully, victory or defeat will be coming on strong. Jessica Stark probably gets first run on the pace setters and East Hall, 6 1 10, the contenders. Also notable that uh, Edgar Prado goes down to Louisiana Downs for the ride on Saturday on uh, victory nor defeat. All right. Yeah, well, he rode the horse decently to the third place finish in the Cherokee run. I think Nick's figures that he's familiar with. You know, interesting enough, Edgar doesn't have many rides this year. I was checking his stat. I think it's 60 dirt routes in the last 12 months, uh, but he's got a 15% flat bet profit if you bet him 
in those dirt routes. Yeah, he, he kind of had a little, uh, just a touch of a renaissance earlier this year, and then things kind of flattened out over the summertime a little bit. But he had some nice wins up at Saratoga, so maybe things, are, uh, things will look up again on Saturday. All right, Saturday also, at Kentucky Downs, uh, the Dueling Grounds Derby, quarter of a million dollars. They're on the grass at a mile and five sixteenths. And again, it's kind of a fun full field, field of 10 in here. Uh, Maya Fleet is going to show some speed. Zoom Global View on occasion, if you go back in the past performances, has shown some ability. The win in the generous at uh, uh, Hollywood Park certainly was some ability there. And Drayden Van Dyke will be on board. Um, the metal count, I think, is interesting. But you wonder about the surface switch for metal count. But the one that I'm going to take a look at here with a video replay, go back to Saratoga on July 18th, an allowance win by Can't Help Believing. Can't Help Believing will be the number three horse. Number two will be Maya Fleet. And again, Maya Fleet probably will be the pace setter in this race on Saturday. But we're watching number three, Can't Help Believing, over number two, Maya Fleet. And as I say, Can't Help Believing, probably the most intriguing uh, horse for me, comes in for, off this win for Graham Motion. What were your thoughts on the Dueling Grounds Derby? Well, first of all, I hope everybody watches these races at Kentucky Downs. They're going to be fantastic. There's a chance of rain. It's a unique European-style course with a dog leg and a big wide turn. It's got ups and downs, hills and valleys. This is almost a full round around the course of 1 and 5, 16. Starts just past the finish line and goes around once. Horses love it or hate it. Um, but I am going to go with Maya Fleet off of, that, off of that race because following that race, he came back to win uh, a mile and a half at yeah. Saratoga August 10th. And he really improved. He moved to the barn of a low percent, a low profile player named James Lawrence, uh, which you might know more because I think he trains on the New York Circuit. Big. So certainly, usually these horses are stable as Clear Hills. And he's won 20% of his races this year. But he went to Lawrence's barn. He ran second and first. He's the Fleet Alex out of a lasting approval mare. Lots of turf in his pedigrees. Cutting back, believe it or not, from 12 to 10 and a half furlongs. So that's certainly in his favor. And uh, I think he will be on the lead. He did show a little closing style back at Penn on Dirt uh, back in March, but he's certainly gone to the lead this time, and Andrew Gonzalez gets the call. Um, it's just an interesting race. I wouldn't argue with anybody on a number of these. Proud Azteca can't help believing. Uh, Metal Count, of course, who's one for one on the grass. Uh, the five, Pumpkin Rumble. Uh, the seven, Captain Dixie. They all have a shot. Global View as well. But I think Maya Fleet, you got to go through a horse on the lead when you're going this far. If he can get to a steady stride, I don't think he's going to go 50 and 114 like he did at Saratoga. But they might leave him alone, and if he does, he certainly got the numbers to do it. His 109 Echo Bay speaker coming out of his allowance win is as good as the fourth place finish from Global View in the Secretariat. So, you know, that's about as good as anybody in this field to run. So that's, I'll take a shot with him. Yeah, and it is worth reiterating, he did come back off that race we watched where he kind of got swallowed up, I can't help believing, and won uh, on the front end going a mile and a half last time at Saratoga, so in an improved performance, so that is worth noting. Uh, before we move on from this race, just what are your thoughts on medal count? I didn't know what to do with him. Well, again, you got the issue, it's in my notes here, you got the issue where he's one for one on the grass, um, his third place finish in the Belmont got a 107 figure, so it's, compar it's comparable. Certainly, uh, Dale Rollins put a nice work back at Churchill and him, third best of 47. The question is, you know, really whether he wants to go this far. He's some Bald Song on the bottom, Donald Formula on top. I think he does. But the Haskell was such a bad race. And I usually make the, especially Derby time, and this is a Derby, um, I make the, the, the comment a lot of times you can't get from there to here. And when a horse runs ninth beat in 23, it's hard to imagine him then winning his next start. And that's my only comment about why he's not a top contender for me. He's in that group of six or seven that I'm probably going to put in the exotic. All right. Let's move on finally to the Los Alamitos Mile on uh, Saturday. $200,000 purse, and as the uh, title indicates, one mile distance for three-year-olds and up. Clubhouse ride in here, a game uh, campaigner in the older division out in Southern California. Soy Fett, I think, is a little bit interesting in here. If you draw a line through that last race anyway, you go back just before that, won a nice race right here at La Salle. But Ellis, while we talk, I'm going to pull up a, a race of a horse that may float under the radar a little bit as this horse is stepping up and only the fifth career start, Masochistic. We're going to go back to Del Mar on August 23rd and watch an allowance optional claiming win by the number five Masochistic. I think this will be the horse that takes all the action coming off the three-race win streak that was capped by this race. But 
this is a horse stepping up, so you can make that argument against them, against a couple others in here that have some nice stakes experience, including over this La Salle surface. Which direction did you go? Well, for those that didn't, uh, that don't follow the cir either circuit, Kentucky or California, you wouldn't know about this horse. What happened was there was a very questionable ride in his debut on March 15th, um, in which it looked to a lot of people, and I'm not going to agree necessarily, that the horse was stiff. And it turned, it turned out that the horse had an overage of tranquilizer, and the trainer got, I think, fine for it. Um, then they put Victor Espino, they shipped to Kentucky. There was no reason to do that, to run him on Derby Day. He won by 14 uh, with a decent purse, but he was no secret. He went off a 2-1. to one. Since then, he went back to California, and he's a Calbred. On a Calbred allowance and an open allowance, but I'm telling you, Seth, there is nobody faster than this horse in the first quarter mile in this race and in most races. Until I see, as far as I'm concerned, he's unbeaten because that first race he was overdosed with the tranquilizer, at least according to the record, steward's records. Um, and in this particular case, there's nobody faster than him. And until he gets beaten, he gets beaten. It's one of those darn if you do, darn if you don't situations. If anybody goes with him, they compromise their own chances. I don't think you can even press him. And he's only asked to go another furlong here. He won seven furlongs at Del Mar. 23, 45, and 3. That was a paid workout. He's capable of going 21 and change on a fast track like he did at Churchill. He just he just towers over these. And it's not a great betting race, I think, because everybody knows this is a wise guy horse, you know, since that uh, kind of coup uh, on Derby Day. But uh, the, the three horses can run second. So I fast these, the six, seven Cates event and the eight Sky Kingdom. So for betting purposes, two over six, seven, eight. But the reason I want to talk about this race is just because this is a fast, fast horse, and if he wins the mile here, they really have a lot of options. They can try to think about the dirt mile. They can cut back to a sprint. I'm sure they'll be thinking Peter's Cup after this. And so people need to have him on the radar to be able to figure out what's going on, especially yeah. after, you know, Bayern flop. Absolutely. He certainly ha has shown the potential so far to be something special, so it's worth taking a look at this race on Saturday from La Salle. Ellis, absolutely we appreciate the uh, visit and the return to uh, – the studio and hearing from you again after seven weeks up in Saratoga. We always like to be up there, but we like to join uh, some of the semi-regulars when we come back to the studio. So we appreciated the visit and the thoughts this morning. I know you're on your way to tape uh, with our friends at HRRN, the Horse Racing Radio Network, for more stakes previews for the weekend. So folks can tune in and uh, get some of your thoughts on that as well at the Horse Racing Radio Network website. Ellis, thanks for the visit. Thanks very much, Seth. We'll be on 6 to 7 tonight, by the way. Sounds good. Ellis Starr, National Racing Analyst from Equibase. We'll take our next break. When we come back, and take a look at a couple of stakes races from this past holiday weekend that otherwise might go under the radar but are worth taking a look at. And then a few minutes after that, we'll be joined by Jenny Reese of the Louisville Courier-Journal. Stay tuned. Face it, most horse racing websites are just too much, too much clutter, too much to navigate through. Next time, log on to CapitalOTB.com. Our newly designed website is easier than ever to use with all the information the professional horse player needs. CapitalOTB.com. I got it. Watch me. I got it. Hey! I got something that makes me want to shout. I got something that tells me what it's all about. I got to move. That tell me what to do If you don't, brothers and sisters Then you won't know huh, What it's all about <laughs> But here comes Fiede With a final try Who will win the Travers? It will be too close to call Fiede surging After Wicked Strong Missed one of our TV shows? No worries. Now you can catch all your favorite programs online. Simply log on to CapitalOTV.com and click on the YouTube link at the bottom of the homepage. And look for our new podcast coming soon. CapitalOTV.com. Log on today. Using CapitalOTVBet.com is as easy as one, two, three. One, simply log on with your username and password from the homepage. Two, fund your Capital OTB account through our Easy Money, Green Dot, or Visa MasterCard options. And three, place your bet on one of our three easy-to-navigate wagering platforms, Capital Bet TV, Capital Bet Express, or Capital Bet Pro. CapitalOTBBet.com. Log on today. I'm Jeff Carl. Join me Saturdays and Sundays at 9 for the Handicappers Report.
We'll handicap the top tracks across the country and help you prepare for the weekend in racing. That's the Handicappers Report, weekends at 9, only here on the OTB TV Network. This is Racing Across America with Seth Merrow. Welcome back. I have a few minutes here just uh, for some stakes recap from this past uh, holiday weekend. And I wanted to just go back and take a look at Parks because Parks may not be on some people's radar, but they had a nice big weekend uh, this past weekend, which is kind of a prelude to, uh, what, three weeks from now, two weeks from now, 24th, uh, the uh, Pennsylvania Derby, the Cotillion and whatnot, which is going to be an incredible day. Um, but they had some prep races uh, for some of those events and then just some other nice stakes races on the car card. The Greenwood Cup, which is a mile and a half down there for uh, $200,000. Micromanage scratched out of the, uh, the Woodward at uh, Saratoga to run in this. Micromanage winds up running third as the even money favorite in here. Carey Street upsets at 28 to 1, going a mile and a half in 230.71. Carey Street would have been a tough play. At the, 28 to 1 was a little steep uh, off of, you know, had been off since June, second place, a third place, a first place going back three races. So it, it, it may be tough to, to use on top, but at the price, maybe it was worth taking a little bit of a look at. But Micromanage, again, skips the uh, Woodward, goes down to Parks, winds up running third as the even money favorite in the Greenwood. Uh, also on the card on Saturday was the uh, Turf Amazon for uh, Phillies and Mayors going five furlongs on the turf. That was won by Quality Lass at eight to one. The favorite in there at three to one was Jewel of a Cat. So the betting public was having a little trouble to deciding where to go. Jewel of a Cat came out of a second place finish in a stake up at Saratoga. And again, wind up, wound up being the favorite, but winds up running third in there. Quality Lass came out of a uh, stakes win, or it came out of an allowance optional claimer actually down at Delaware. Delaware uh, over the summer produced some nice winners at various venues around the country in some stakes races, including of course that Arlington Million, that crazy Arlington Million win. Uh, gonna take a look at a couple of races though. Uh, we'll look at them in their entirety. This, the Smarty Jones is first up. That was on th this holiday, a Monday card down at Parks. Wanted to show that because potentially this is a prep for the Pennsylvania Derby. The winner in here is going to be Protonico coming out of a second place, coming out of a third place finish, excuse me. We talked about this a little with Ellis in the Curlin. Of course, the winner of the Curlin came back to win the Travers, VE Day. Protonico ran third, will win this uh, Smarty Jones. And again, this is uh, uh, the prep, uh, a prep for uh, the Pennsylvania Derby, but it's Todd Pletcher. Will he come back? Will he turn around that quick? I don't know, but this is a horse that's fairly lightly raced. This was only the fifth career start, will be the third career win. So Protonico is just worth taking a look at. Underneath was cl classic jock and roll, and the beaten favorite running third, the number three horse, Albano, at seven to five. Albano, of course, we're all familiar with as uh, having shown some ability down at the fairgrounds earlier this year. Um, and in fact, two races back, won the Pegasus at uh, Monmouth before running second to Bayern in the uh, Haskell. So uh, it winds up being number eight, Protonico, number two, Classic Giacarol, number uh, three, Albano. But I just wanted to show you this because, again, I think Protonico, going to the Pennsylvania Derby or not, will be kind of an interesting three-year-old to keep our eyes on. So up next is the Smarty Jones from this past Monday at Parks. Okay. And they're off. Albano gets a great start. Between horses, Grasshop and his hustling out of there. Ain't got no time flashing his speed from the inside. Just Call Kenny will be caught four wide into the turn. Almost Famous moving up three wide. So there are four abreast into the first turn. Albano just in behind that lead group in fifth. On the outside, Protonico moving up nicely into the sixth position. Classic jock and roll will settle in while saving ground seventh. And it's Saw Me. And at the back is joint custody. The Smarty Jones Fields moves to the back stretch. Ain't got time, leads three parts of a length. Grasshop and prompting the pace in between horses. Another deck back to a three wide, just call Kenny. Still right with the front runners in third. Albano getting a great trip in behind the lead. He's down inside fourth and is only about two and a half lengths behind. Almost famous is three wide at the half mile pole. Protonico is between horses with that second group. He's only three back with a half mile to run. Classic jock and roll begins to improve his position at the inside. And then it's Saw Me and Joint Custody. Looks wide open with three gates to go. On the outside, here comes a three wide bid from Just Call Kenny. 
Ain't Got Time trying to hold tough at the inside. Long shot grass up and trying to hold tough between horses. Albano trying to find some room. Far outside, it's almost famous. They approach the top of the stretch now, and here comes Albano. Albano has found room and has come through to get the lead. Classic chalk and roll making a bit down at the inside. Just call Kenny is weakened. Britannico was caught in behind horses. On the outside, it's almost famous. Here comes classic chalk and roll on the inside. Classic chalk and roll to take the lead from Albano. Britannico is in the clear late. They're coming down to the finish. Britannico flying late on the outside. Britannico, yes, sir. Britannico, a late surge to win it. And again, Patanico, I think, will be one to watch. Nice late run from, from Patanico. Uh, Giants Causeway uh, son out of an AP Indy mayor, trained by Todd Pletcher. So we'll see. Uh, you know, for a Todd Pletcher runner, the, the comeback in the Pennsylvania Derby seems a little bit quick. But with only five starts under the belt, uh, now three wins, including uh, what I thought were there was a, a kind of nice win. It looked like uh, classic Jack Aroll had things uh, wrapped up probably at about the eighth pole, but Pratonico makes that nice late, late run. So I think a three-year-old worth keeping our eyes on. And finally, before we go to our next break, just want to uh, take a look at the Turf Monster uh, back on uh, Monday at Parks because it features our old friend Ben's cat. Always like to uh, show Ben's cat. The uh, eight-year-old that has over $2 million in the bank. Uh, Ben's cat was coming out of the July 12th Parks Dash. Again, five furlongs right here on this Parks Strip. The Turf Monster, five furlongs on the turf for $300,000. Ben's cat will be the number seven horse. Sharp Sensation is the number three horse. Sharp Sensation would have been a tough call uh, coming off of a seventh and a fifth place finish. And that fifth place finish two, backs, well, two back was in the Parks Dash behind Ben's cat. Uh, also in the uh, top three here, coming down under the wire will be the uh, number nine tight end touchdown, that very bona fide turf sprinter of stakes quality that had finished second to Ben's Cat in the Parks Dash. So again, keep your eyes coming under the wire. Number seven, Ben's Cat. Number three, Sharp Sensation. Number nine, tight end touchdown. I won't spill it if you didn't see the race. You can just keep your eyes on those three and, and uh enjoy the race and, and root for uh, the venerable eight-year-old Ben's cat as the number seven horse in here. It is the Turf Monster. After this, I'll come back for a minute and then we'll go into the next break. Eight, and they're off. Berlino to Tiger shows first. On the outside, here comes Bold Thunder charging up to be second, tight end touchdown third. Far outside, Petey Kramer fourth, sharp sensation fifth, private zone down in tight inside sixth. Tell all you know with seventh, Ben's Cat eighth on the outside. Ben's Cat is just better than six back right now. After that, when comes AP Elvis, Storm of the Century, and on the outside, it's Risk Factor. They round the far turn, less than three gates to go. Bold Thunder gets clear by two. Berlino de Tiger quickly closes that gap second. Here comes a strong bit from Sharp Sensation on the outside. Tight end touchdown swings to the middle of the course. Still a lot of work to do for Ben's Cat. Ben's Cat still five back with an eight to go. Sharp sensation to take the lead. Tight end touchdown on the outside. Ben's Cat has hit his best right on the far outside. Sharp sensation has the lead. Ben's Cat coming late. Sharp sensation. Can Ben's Cat get him on the line? Sharp sensation, Ben's Cat. Sharp sensation's got it by a neck. Sharp sensation over Ben's Cat. Tight end touchdown was there. Oh, so it was very, very close there. Ben's Cat making a nice late run, but just a little bit too late. Winds up, according to the chart, a neck short. It is sharp sensation at 16 to 1. And as I said, he would have been a tough call in here, coming off a, a well-beaten seventh last time. But again, prior to that, fairly well-beaten. You know, it was almost three lengths behind Ben's Cat in that Parks Dash back on uh, July 12th. So again, this was a bona fide upset, but it was a nice run from uh, Ben's cat regardless. All right, we will head into our next break. When we come back, we'll be joined by Jenny Reese of the Louisville Courier Journal, I believe. As, when I talked to her yesterday, she was planning to be on the back stretch of Churchill Downs, so we'll connect with her there, talk a little bit about this 12-day Churchill meet that kicks off this evening with a Downs After Dark program, but we'll also talk about some of the nice stakes tomorrow, a couple of nice two-year-old stakes on the Churchill card. All of that right after this. Stay tuned. This is Racing Across America with Seth Merrow. The future of online betting is here and only at the all-new CapitalOTBBet.com. 
CapitalOTVBet.com delivers a state-of-the-art wagering experience found nowhere else in horse racing. CapitalOTVBet.com. Log on today. Each morning on the OTB TV network, you get the very best in horse racing programming. Weekdays begin with the Handicappers Report, where professional handicappers share their selections and analysis of the day's racing. Followed by Racing Across America, a daily conversation with racing personalities from around the country. Saturdays include Down the Stretch, where Mark Cassano speaks with the biggest names in racing. And Sunday mornings, it's Loose on the Lead, where Steve Bick and I offer news and a unique lineup of weekly guests. All here on the OTB TV network. Fascinated by the world of horse racing? Interested in honing your handicapping skills? Class is in session. Night school, Monday nights. Easy to access online. It's free, interactive, and informative for the casual and serious race fan. Horse player now buzz. Live horses to watch emailed to you daily. Our eyes, your prize. Night school in the buzz. Visit horseplayernow.com for details. Funding your capital OTB bet account is as easy as one, two, three. One, easy money. Clearly the fastest and easiest method of depositing funds into your account. Make deposits or withdrawals in just minutes. Two, Green Dot Money Pack gives you instant access to your funds. Green Dot Money Packs are available at thousands of retailers nationwide. And three, MasterCard Visa. Simply click on the link from the funding page, enter your account information, and fund your account. CapitalOTBPet.com. Log on today. Hey, race fans, head down to the all-new Clubhouse Racebook. With live horse racing on more than 250 flat-screen TVs, state-of-the-art wagering terminals, and amazing Vegas-style atmosphere, the Clubhouse Racebook, 711 Central Avenue, Albany. Welcome back to Racing Across America on this Friday morning as we move back into the studio in Albany after a nice season up at uh, Saratoga. And again, I want to thank all the folks. I said this on Labor Day when we wound things up. Uh, thank all the folks who uh, stopped me during the uh, Saratoga meet over on the front side and expressed uh, their uh, uh, pleasure in watching the, the morning programming, not just our show, but uh, the weekend uh, programming as well and the handicapper support and whatnot. So always appreciate the feedback when we're down here in the studio. We don't get that much of it, but it was uh, fun, again, to, to walk through the grandstand during the uh, meet and hear uh, f folks who appreciated uh, what we do here on the network. Always uh, and I, I pass that on as well to the guys uh, behind the the, uh, the cameras here uh, in the studio down in uh, Schenectady as well. They all do a great job, and I talked about all of them on uh, Monday as well. Just be, uh, we're attempting to, to get Jenny on the phone right now. Jenny Reese of the Louisville Courier Journal. We'll have her momentarily, and in fact, I think we have her now. Jenny, are you on the air? This phone to try to. Um order a veterinary product and my other phone with the battery was about empty and so and then I screwed up picking up the line so I apologize <laughs> I'm on the line now yes I am here that works that works it is Jenny Reese of the Louisville Courier Journal I said earlier we love being up in Saratoga live from the back stretch and talking to guys like Jonathan Shepard and Jimmy Jerkins as they're all a gol golf cart ride away, but we also like to get back in the studio and talk to the folks that we don't get to talk to up at Saratoga. And Jenny Reese from the Louisville Courier Journal is one of those. And Jenny, just before we uh, start talking about the Churchill meet and some other things, um, it, it has been uh, six or seven weeks now that we haven't talked to a lot of the phone guests. A lot of things have happened. I mentioned earlier Travers with uh, Jimmy Jerkins, uh, the Woodward, and the Whitney and Palace Malice being a dud in the Whitney over on the West Coast. You had shared belief, kind of validating his uh, talent in the Pacific Classic. What were your some some of your highlights from the summer? Strike Impact winning on the last jump <laughs> 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 last Saturday at Arlington Park. But no, seriously, it's been a pretty fun summer. I didn't get to do any traveling. Um, to feel budget cutbacks, and I wish I'd been up there at Saratoga to talk to you all in person. But um, uh, you know, we had up until the last week or so it was very pleasant weather and uh, there was a lot of good racing to watch on, on TV. Like you mentioned, the dominant performance of uh, shared belief and I was really happy to see It's My Lucky Day in the Woodward. You really root for people like Eddie Plessa, Plessa Jr. And um, um, just, um, yeah, the, and the Travers, what a great uh, finish and outcome that was. And, and I'm excited. Now we've got Churchill's opening It's Fall Meet. Um, and there's a lot of, you know, stake racing tomorrow in Kentucky, even as kind of we get a little break from a, uh, you know, lull in, in New York and California. Um, 
that uh, like what there's a total of seven stakes tomorrow in Kentucky. Yeah, it, it is very exciting in Kentucky as both Kentucky Downs and Churchill kick off. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about that in a second. But now I want to get to what you alluded to a moment ago. Before we talk about the weekend, I want to go back to uh, last weekend. And every time we talk to you, we get an update on Strike Impact. The horse is trained and owned by uh, your husband and yourself. Um, Strike Impact ran at Arlington last Sunday. Or was it sat Saturday? Saturday. 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 Again. Yeah, Saturday. Uh, claimer, eighteen to twenty thousand dollar tags. It was on the grass at a mile and a sixteenth. And Jenny, we have the very exciting stretch run here and Strike Impact. Cool. The horse, as I say, <clears throat> that we have been following with you for a while now. Strike Impact yes. is the number no, yeah. the number three horse. And so I'll <laughs> tell people keep your eyes on the number three because again, this is an incredibly exciting stretch run. Were you in town and, and give us, were you in town for it and give us uh, your your thoughts? Well. One thing, you know, James Graham had never rode the horse before. In fact, says to him in the paddock, he says, um, just try to, you know, maybe have him, you know, you know, a few links off it. He said, but the horse does not like to be inside, so see if you can work your way to the outside. And in the stretch, if somebody's trying to make a run at you, um, make them come inside you, um, not around you. And um, so we're watching them. We think it's 16, I think there's no way the horse is going to get up there, right? And, uh, and it looks like, but he had nowhere to go most of the race. And then it looks like he's going to duck to the outside. And then he ducks to the inside. And we're like, ah. Oh. And then he gets up and wins. It was a great ride. And um, Graham had an interesting explanation that I'd like to ask him about it again. Just because having, having had the chance to watch the replay, somebody said, not that the horse doesn't like being inside horses. He thinks he's getting away with something. So I want to know how we got him to un, un get away with uh <laughs> but it was great. The horse shows he wants to be a racehorse at age 10. He doesn't know he's 10. He looks like he's about four. Um, and he trains like he's about four. And, and mentally, a lot of times, he still acts like he's two. Uh, came out of the race great. And, um, you know, just looking forward to continuing the campaign. And once again, thank you very much for asking about him. Uh, happy to do it. Yeah, 10 years old, over $700,000 now in the bank. Uh, he's got to be a lot of fun to own and train and watch. And he's certainly been fun for us, as I say, when we have you on to, to follow yeah, him. So. And, and I, I do just want to make one point, because some people say, well, why is he even running? Because he has one, two, he's a two-time stakes winner, non-graded stakes. And stuff. He's running because he wants to run. He's not a horse to do well in retirement. He's sound. Um, not always sound of mind, but sound of body. And uh, when he wants to retire, the owners, pet uh, partners, have a beautiful paddock and a beautiful stall and a brand new barn that will be his, uh, you know, his home. But we just don't think he's a horse. So he he wants to be around people. He wants to be at the racetrack. He gets mad if he's not the first horse to train every day. Um, <laughs> And so that's why he's running, because he wants to run. Yeah, and a race like we just saw shows that. I mean, there's some real determination there, because as you say, just watching it, knowing the outcome, about uh, you know 200 yards from the wire, you think, well, that's not going to happen. But it gets up there and gets it done. So it's really, uh, again, those are the game old ca campaigners that are fun to watch. All right, let's shift our attention out of Kentucky over the weekend. And again, let's get a little overview. Kentucky Downs on Saturday, Churchill Downs opens tonight with Downs uh, after dark. What does kind of a, a, you know, a conflict uh, there mean? I'm assuming at, at the very least, it probably means this meet maybe a little less turf racing at Churchill Downs? Yes, yeah. And that's what they did last September, which was the first time they did it. They just can't compete with Kentucky Downs. Two things. They can't compete with the money, a million dollars a day that Kentucky Downs is offering. And they don't want to tear up the turf course, you know, for November, their November meet. So they have limited, but they do have some turf racing. And um, I noticed those races have been doing very well at Churchill. Um, I'm glad to see that they're doing the Downs After Dark night cards on Fridays. Uh, the high schools might not be happy about that high school football, but it really makes sense to me from the standpoint of, like, tomorrow night U of L plays at home, you know, a quarter of a mile away. And, you know, they're going to have four stakes tomorrow afternoon here. And hopefully some people will come and tailgate at the track before going over there rather than, um, you know, trying to guess when is U of L going to play. Just keep the night racing on the Fridays. And the other thing is I think what's good, if you're going to have four stakes, I hated when they had like four stakes at night. Because even though it did give a kind of, you know, electric feeling, it was kind of cool watching it on the grandstand. So many of the people that are there for night racing are not there to appreciate really good horse racing they're there to have a good time and that's fine but i think 
it can actually scare off some of the fans that really would like to go and see really good horse racing because they feel like it's just a bunch of drunk kids, which there are, but it's more than that. Uh, so I'm, I'm very happy the way they're doing it. And then a week from Saturday, on the big screen, Churchill's going to show, you know, uh, it's a 12 30 kickoff. U of L is at Virginia. And of course, uh, the first race is 12 45. They're going to show on their, their new big, um, you know, largest outdoor high def, whatever in the world, the U of L game. And then they're going to have, you know, like Budweiser special prices and stuff. And I think that'll be, I mean, they're trying some new things. And I'm actually looking forward to this, this um, meet. The last couple of meets have been very rough at Churchill. Um, you know, the the money is only okay. Um, actually, I had a column looking at the meet today and putting out the very nice horse at Hebronville. Lynn Whiting's twice shipped to break his maiden um, and then to win a 67000 allowance race, two-year-old, um, because it just wasn't the opportunities of, and, and the, the money was just so much better there in Kentucky. I thought, what's wrong with it? I mean, it, but it was better in Pennsylvania. But what's wrong with this picture? Here you have Kentucky and... Uh, not that there aren't some, you know, like there's the Iroquois tomorrow, but it's a mile on the 16th. Uh, it's just really sad what's happened. And having said all that, despite this ongoing erosion for the last 12 years in Kentucky, you still see these $100,000 stakes like tomorrow. They have some really good fields, like the Locust Grove. It's not graded. It's 100000 There's two graded stakes winners and a grade two winner in there. It's got Rhea Antonia, the Breeders' Cup Juvenile Phillies winner, and, and – um, our, uh, on Fire Baby, he's a two-time grade one winner. And um, Molly Morgan, who um, beat On Fire Baby to win the Fleur de Leon, was just second in the, the grade one um, La Troyenne that On Fire Baby won on Derby Day. Um, and you look at, you know, the fields in the Pocahontas for two-year-old fillies and the Iroquois for two-year-olds look wide open, and I'm excited to see what horses are going to come out of there. Last year, it was just, it came out of those races included Taffature, uh, who got beat in the um, uh, Iroquois, and they came back and won the Kentucky Jockey Club. He's gone on to win four grade stakes. And well, my understanding is he's running in the Pennsylvania Derby. And then, of course, in the Pocahontas, um, you had um, um, Untappable, the Kentucky Oaks winner. Yeah, I, I, <clears throat> excuse me. I think the entire stakes card tomorrow is kind of intriguing. And before we get into those two-year-old races, I just want to reiterate, as you said, the Locust Grove, I think you have a seven-horse field. On Fire Baby, as you said, Rhea Antonia. Also, Don't Tell Sophia and Molly Morgan. So it's seven, yeah, but I it's a... Yeah, I forgot about Don't Tell Sophia. She is a very nice <laughs> yeah. multiple stakes win, graded stakes winner, yes. Yeah. Yeah, so that is a very fun field. And then the ACAC -AC is interesting. It's a shorter field with only five. Unfortunately, it was going to be the return of Lee, who was entered in a, uh, uh, as a main track only in the turf stake up at Saratoga last weekend. Bill Mott was on one of the shows here on the network and said they, they thought Woodward, but then they wanted to get a comeback with maybe an easier spot. And I did read uh, Lee came down with a, a fever. Yes, yeah, like the temperature. Um, but for a five-horse field, those are you know, five nice, they're all stakes winners in there. I think three of them are graded stakes winners. The Carve is getting really good. Speaking of the daily racing form, pointed this out. The Carve was claimed off of Claiborne in his first start. Um, so they they don't have Lee running in there, but they have a Claiborne red in there. But um, I guess the point I would make about that stake, too, is, you know, you wish there were more than five in there, but better to have five like that in a race like that than there is a race tonight that is, has five horse fields for 10 claiming. And that's, you know, it's not all puppies and roses here for sure. And, and again, it is a five horse field and it would have been fun to have Lee in on the comeback, Absolutely. but it's an, a really interesting five horse field. You also have flashback, first time out for Wayne Catalano after moving out of the Baffert barn and Carve, as you mentioned. Braidster is a horse I've always liked. I think Carve and Braidster are kind of horses who are sitting uh, firmly on that second tier of handicap division horses, but on their given day can, can run some nice races. So I think those two are kind of fun, but let's uh, uh, move over and take a little focus now on the two two-year-old races, cause, because as you say, these can produce horses that are nice to watch moving later into the two-year-old season and certainly into uh, the three-year-old season. Let's take a look uh, first at the uh, Iroquois, and I pulled up some video here of Bold Conquest going back to August 16th up at Saratoga. 
Bold Conquest will uh, be the number seven horse in this race. This is a Steve Asmussen runner. Bold Conquest in the career debut had run second. As a lot of Asmussen horses do, improved in the second career start. Now the first start was five and a half. This race we're watching here, again, number seven is Bold Conquest is six and a half, but does stretch to a mile and a sixteenth. Uh, tomorrow in the Iroquois, but a nice field of nine in here. It's two-year-olds for a uh, hundred thousand dollars going a mile and a sixteenth. What were your thoughts on the Iroquois? Yeah, well, I agree with Bull Conquest. I think that's a nice price at four to one. But I think this is a, you know, a, a real wide open race. Mister Z is the favorite, and deservedly so off his second in the Sanford and the Saratoga Special, and when he, you know, ran well to uh, I spent it. Um, He's a, a horse that looks like he's going to want to go a longer distance. And, um, you know, I think he's the one that, you know, you're going to have to, to beat. But I think hashtag bourbon, who's actually the first stakes winner by Super Saver. Then he had the uh, uh, two at Saratoga. Uh, but he was very impressive in winning the Mountaineer Juvenile. And he certainly looks like a horse who's going to be happy with two turns. And, um you know, lucky player, the other Asmussen horse. I've got to watch the other Asmussen horse. It's, it's like so often with trainers in general, like, pleasure, watch the other one. Um, you know, Grand Motion's bringing one in for West Point Thoroughbreds that, um, you know, ran in the Saratoga Special and finished fourth, but it's first time LASIK. That's interesting. Uh, uh, just, uh, you know, I think you know, Kenny McPeak, Holy Frazier, um, you know, We've seen this before, these horses coming out of these mild turf races at Ellis Park, uh, popping up and winning here, like including um, Claiborne last year for, for Dale Romans. Dale's got Danny Boy in here, who is coming out of a mild maiden win at Ellis. And the thing is, it's not usually, those are grass races. It's not the grass they're looking for there. It's the distance they're looking for there and, uh, and the, uh, the two turns. So, um, you know, it'll be... It, it, you know, I think it's a great betting race. I think it, you're going to have really good value in your, your trifectas and uh, your superfectas for sure. Yeah, and, and uh, I found Danny Boy kind of intriguing, and you made a couple of great points there. He won it similarly with Claiborne last year, but you also made another great point for handicappers. At this time of year, these horses coming out of turf races and going to dirt races, a lot of times in August, they're just looking for the distance, and they're not going to get that on the dirt. So they're over on the turf looking for two turns, and they may be horses that, that just the connections want the distance, and they're looking dirt down the road anyway. So it's not that yeah. big of a deal to surface. Yeah, with. absolutely. And here a lot of them are it's from Ellis, but, you know, not in this particular race, but like you said, your point's well made. You see it at Saratoga, too. Uh, they're, they're on the turf to get the distance at Saratoga. So... Yeah, um, so, um, um, you know, I mean, I mean, well, I don't know if the gorilla man could win. I was looking to see that, you know, he, uh, just, I think it's a really good, good bet and race, and, and I think the, uh, the, Pocahontas is as well. Yeah, let's let's touch on the Pocahontas. Great two event. Again, $200,000, mile and a 16th. While we talk about this one, I went back to the maiden breaker for Take Charge Brandy. Uh, of course, the same uh, connections as Take Charge Indy. And uh, uh, this is going back to June. This was the career debut. Uh, Take Charge Brandy will be the number eight horse. Wins pretty easily for a trainer, D. Wayne Lucas. Subsequently, they went up pretty good second in the Schuylerville behind a talented Pletcher horse, Fashion Alert, and then a disappointing fifth in the uh, Adirondack. Stretches out to two turns off a of bullet work. So I think Take Charge Brandy, maybe on a, also a little horse for a course angle, could be a little bit interesting in here. What were your thoughts on the Pocahontas? Yeah, I like her, too. Of course, she's, she's not, because uh, I've made this mistake, she's not a half to Take Charge Indy and will Take Charge, but I think Charming Her Dam is out of... Uh, Take Charge late. So she's closely related to We'll Take Charge and um, Take Charge in the, on the female side. And I remember her main race. I was actually up at Arlington, uh, and we watched that race on TV. And I want to say she kind of maybe acted up before loading in the gate. And so that was a weird race. I think a couple of horses might have ended up being scratched out of there uh, at the gate because of gate hysteria or whatever. So for her to come back and win was, you know, win that race, uh, I think you know, showed her ability. I know that there's one that they've been very high, I know they've been very high on her um, all along, and uh, you know, I'm not sure what happened in the last race. Uh, Cavorting's a nice horse, but she did get beat 13 and three-quarter lengths, and and uh, maybe just, you know, throw that out. Like I said, she's 
uh, got a month off, and she has this bullet work. And um, um, but you know, let's see who else is in here. You've got um, um, you know Jimmy Toner shipping in from Saratoga from New York uh, with the filly that was fixed in the Adirondack. Um, Dale has Christina's journey. Um, Nick Peek has Pangburn. I mean, clearly Take Charge Brandy is the class. I mean, she's the only one that's graded stakes place in here. Uh, so I really, then you've got, you know, Tom Amos is true to you, um, coming out of the best race at Indy. Yeah, I think once you get past Take Charge Brandy, it's anyone's race. But having said that, Take Charge Brandy probably doesn't have to win. You just, I just don't know how to analyze that last race of hers. It's completely a throw out. But look at her, um, her, uh, both of her, um, well, they're not her brothers. I guess they're her cousins or uncles or whatever. But, uh, you know, we'll take charge with throwing some clunkers, wouldn't he? And then come back and, and uh, run some brilliant races. I also find in here on the same uh, theory we talked about in the, the uh, prior race, the Iroquois, Pangburn is a little bit interesting coming out of that mile down at Ellis for Kenny McPeak. So that's what I'll take a look at also. And, and the, you know, the question mark on all these is going to be the distance, but that's what makes them uh, fun races at this time of year for the two-year-olds. All right, Jenny, we've got to wrap things up, but we absolutely appreciate the visit. Again, congratulations on the win last weekend for uh, Strike Impact. Enjoy uh, the uh, short uh, September meet down at Churchill Downs. We'll check in with you again as things progress along, but we appreciate the visit today. Sounds great, Seth, and happy handicapping. Thanks a lot. Jenny Reese from the Louisville Courier Journal. All right, that's about time to wrap things up, but I did have some uh, notes I wanted to touch on here. Uh, Dave Litvin had kind of a... Uh, well, it, more of a pre, I was going to say a meat wrap up of Saratoga. It was more, actually more of a preview of, of uh, Belmont. But uh, one of the things he did mention, and one of the things worth mentioning, a new era begins today at uh, Belmont Park. Obviously, Tom Durkin has wrapped things up. John Embrial will be the announcer for uh, Belmont Fall. So that'll be brand new down there. John does a great job. And John is not going to be a shock to the system because he was. Uh, announcing every Monday up at Saratoga, and he announces quite a few races during the rest of the year, and he does a great job, but he will be the uh, announcer down at Belmont. Also, I found it interesting in Litvin's column, he tallied up the uh, number of winning favorites this season at Saratoga, and they're right where they should have been, about 33.4%. And at any meet, race meet, uh, you're looking for 30 to 35 or 36% as being within the norm. So that 33% is right in the norm. The winning favorites, just what you would think up at Saratoga at uh, this recently completed meet. Handle, uh, the United States national handle for uh, August dipped a little bit uh, marginally. Uh, handle went down 0.4%. Uh, uh, however, the number of races was down 2.5%. Uh, so actually, uh, you know, that handle dip is probably not a bad sign at all. If the handle dip is less than the number of races, I, I would think that's a, a good sign. Um, part of what helped August overall was a couple of uh, the August days were right in that uh, Labor Day holiday weekend as well. Uh, but the the, uh, the, uh, the national numbers dipped just incrementally. But again, if you look at that as compared to the numbers uh, number of races run, it was a, a pretty good result. The Saratoga meet, Total sources handle was down 2.6%. However, again, the number of races also went down. Uh, Dave Granick's uh, wrap-up column, which also included an interview with uh, Naira President Chris Kay. And again, we talked to Chris, talked to John Signor, uh, uh, President of Capital OTV, Chris Kay, President of uh, Naira. Uh, both of them, we uh, interviewed them on Monday. You can pull that up on the uh, Capital OTV archive. They were on this show, Racing Across America, on Monday. So we got some of Chris Kay's meet wrap-up thoughts. But again, Dave Grenig interviewed him also uh, for a meet wrap-up. And then within that article, talks a little bit about seven fewer races run this year as compared to 2013. So again, that played, I'm certain, into uh, the uh, overall handle dip. Uh, On-track handle also down a little bit. Attendance, however, was up. There was the controversial uh, in inclusion of the uh, season passes this year, uh, which could have had some effect on that, but it was up 12%, so good numbers attendance-wise. And again, given the less number of races, I think the handle numbers are uh, okay. Uh, there were 193 turf uh, races run, 29 were taken off the turf this year. 
compared with 209 turf races last year and 24 taken off. So there was a little more turf racing. Turf racing also tends to uh, have a, a bigger handle because typically you get bigger fields as well. So a few less turf races probably affected handle. So handle did go down uh, a little bit, but I think there were some mitigating factors there. Attendance up, uh, there were some mitigating factors there as well, perhaps. And also, uh, you can go over to the racing forum and pull up Steve Chris's most recent commentary where he has a nice uh, piece on the uh, quality over quantity at Saratoga this year. I'll pull out one quote, what matters most is the racing, and it seemed like it was the best it has been in years, and I think that's kind of a, a consensus. I think a lot of folks thought the racing up at Saratoga was very good this year. We'll talk a little bit more uh, about the Saratoga season, recap and whatnot next week as we proceed through a fir our first full week back here in the studio. But we've got all the equipment plugged back in. It seems like everything's working as we move from Saratoga back to our Albany studio. Handicappers report a little earlier, racing across America uh, from the 10 to 11 spot. We'll be back in, as I say, all week long next week. Weekend programming, as usual, 9 o'clock Saturday and Sunday. The handicappers report 10 o'clock tomorrow. It's Mark Cassano and Down the Stretch, 10 o'clock on Sunday. It's Steve Bick and myself with Loose on the Lead. Tune in for all of it and enjoy some nice racing as, again, Laurel kicks off. Kentucky Downs over the weekend, Churchill Downs. We're in that summer to late summer, fall transition period. Great racing in front of us. We have some really nice racing in the rearview mirror, but there is some good racing ahead as well. Enjoy all of it. We'll see you back for Racing Across America again, 10 a.m. on Monday morning. You're watching OTB TV, a service of Capital Off Track Betting.